Hello and welcome to this Archer virtual tutorial. This is the first of a series of two virtual tutorials on the topic of version control. So these tutorials are meant to provide an introduction to version control and they should be especially useful if you've never used version control before, at least not knowingly, <laughs> and um, they should equip you with some useful information to be able to decide how version control might be useful in your work and which tools you might like to use. So in this presentation, um, in this part one, I will start by sketching some of the issues with the way that many of us um, um, manage our, our files and different, in particular how we manage different versions of files that we produce as we do our work. In other words, what I'll do is I will highlight some of the some of the problems um, with a do-it-yourself approach to manually managing uh, versions of files. I'll then go on to give an overview of what version control systems offer you as a solution for these problems. So I will describe the benefits of these version control systems. Uh, I will also give some um, uh, insight into the common version control systems that are used and importantly I'll, I'll give an overview of some core concepts and terminology so the idea of this is that although we will be using um, one particular version control system namely SVN as an example at a later stage um, the core concepts and a lot of the terminology uh, that I'm going to talk about is quite generic so it should carry across many different version control systems. So the idea of this tutorial is really to provide you with a grounding, kind of a foundation, from which you can then move on to, to um, pick up uh, whatever version control system ends up suiting your purposes. Um, we'll have a simple demonstration of how to use one of these version control systems, and I will end with a little word of warning. So let's start by looking at the do-it-yourself approach to version control. So in our work, um, one of the things we do is uh, we write papers, so um, or reports, or whatever the case may be. So you might start out with an initial version of a paper, the draft version. You'll work a bit on that, and then produce um, a second draft so in the meanwhile you'll probably keep a copy of this first draft um, because you don't want to, to lose anything um, so you'll have a copy somewhere and you you'll probably be working on a you might be working on a separate file for the second draft now at that stage um, you may decide that oh one of the sections in your paper or in your report actually should be quite drastically reformulated so you create uh, another version of this file where one of the sec one of the sections or subsections is completely different call that paper draft to alternative now you're not yet sure whether you're going to actually keep this drastically different formulation um, but it seemed like a good idea at the time so you have already three different versions of this file now going back to the second draft uh, draft 2 um, you change you make some changes in that draft and arrive at draft three which might include some additional content at that stage um, the work that you're describing is not only your own work but it also involves work uh, done by your colleagues um, Alice and Bob so you want them to contribute some content to this report or paper as well how do you do that? Now, one, one way to do that, uh, which is often used, is you simply take the file, paper draft 3, and you email it to Alice and you email it to Bob. So Alice and Bob each have their own copy of paper draft 3, and they start editing away and adding in their own content. Alice will produce uh, a draft derived from draft 3 called paper draft 4 Alice, to which she has added her content. Then simultaneously Bob will be creating his version which he might uh, 
if he was using the same naming scheme as Alice and as yourself, call paper draft for Bob. Uh, meanwhile, while your co colleagues have been editing um, and adding content, you haven't sat still. You've also kept on working on the paper and you've come up with your own draft for. So once Alice and Bob are done making their changes, um, they will most likely uh, email you their what they consider to be their, their drafts. Now at this stage, uh, you being the, the main author has to make some decisions. Uh, you have to make some decisions about what to do with the content that Alice has added, that you've added, uh, and that Bob has added. So what you want to do is you want to provide, produce a final paper or final draft for submission. You also need to think about some of the earlier changes that you made. For example, this drastically alternative formulation of one of the sections, paper draft two alternative. You need to decide how you are going to merge, i.e. combine the content contained in these one, two, three, four different versions to produce this final version. So we're talking about one, essentially one, one document, one, one file really, and um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight distinct versions potentially of this file. It's just, it's just a simple example, but just set, set the scene, set the context. Now suppose Suppose we weren't talking about a paper or a report, but we were talking about um, source code. So we're talking about software. Now, the analogous process would, would be here that you start out with some initial code. Then um, it doesn't work yet. You work, you, you, you make some changes, you put in some, some, some functions, and you arrive at, uh, say, your first, uh, co your first version of the code that, that compiles and runs. So you call that code, that works. Now, in the same sense as earlier, we replace one of the sections of the paper with a drastic reformulation, you might decide that uh, one of the algorithms you're using is actually not really that optimal or actually gives the wrong result scientifically. So you decide to replace the relevant uh, subroutine or function in your source code with a different algorithm. Therefore, you end up with uh, another version of the same file, code, other algorithm. Now you go back to the um, to the first alg to the first version that worked, code that works, and you think, oh, hang on, actually, okay, I, I used this other algorithm which was was faster or better, but maybe if I simply made some changes to the existing to the first um, algorithm, it could go faster. So you go back to that version, you try to make these changes, and you arrive at, a, at a, another version, uh, code faster. Now this faster code looks like it might be the might be the best um, at the moment. Looks like it might be the best um, basis uh, for which to take further development work. So uh, in this case, again, your colleagues Alice and Bob have some contributions to make. Alice has a great idea for some new functionality that she wants to add, and she has some time to work on this. So you, you email Alice the file. She starts to add those those changes, and she gets she has ends up with her own version, code new functionality. Alice. Bob also makes some changes simultaneously. What they might be is not specified, but he makes he adds some things in, and as before, you keep on working on this code as well, making your own changes. Challenge is similar i.e. in the end you need to come up with a final version of the code or some kind of um, the, the, well, the version that you might use to, to produce results for, for a publication for example or to really run uh, um, a production run of your, of your simulations or your calculations. So at first sight this is quite a similar problem as with uh, the document of the paper um, sketched previously but actually it's, it, it it's, it's could be uh, more complicated yet because when I've described these different versions, I've said it in as if it only concerns uh, one file. But actually, if you have, um, typically you might you might have a code base consisting of various source code files, header files in the case of C++. So, um, in other words, what you have at each at each stage or at each version is not a s a not a version of a single file, but a version of uh, n files, however many files there are, and Moreover, these files have interdependencies. So if you have subroutine or variable 
declarations in in one file that need to be recognized and used in another file uh, those need to agree the names that you give them need to agree the scope needs to agree all these kinds of things so the point is that there are in the case of software there are dependencies between files um, which mean that when you want to produce a final for working version of code code final and you're taking content from different versions you are going to have to be very careful in uh, making sure that that any dependencies are met so for example if you mix and match quite arbitrarily some code from the other algorithm version with the new functionality from Alice version uh, you might get a mismatch uh, because um, the code doesn't 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 uh, doesn't agree of course this will show up when you try to compile and you'll have to debug and you'll have to go if you made a mistake you'll have to go back and um, and, and and change this to, to make the thing make everything agree so this can be quite quite arduous so this is this is a uh, important sketch um, to have in mind when we talk about version control so I've simply highlighted here so uh, some terms that are useful to keep in mind already when we talk about versions and, and their proliferation and managing them is the two concepts of branching and merging branching being uh, the creation of different um, versions derived uh, from a common ancestor merging being the combination uh, the combining of um, content from different files so what's the problem i.e. what's the what's the problem with um, doing what I've described in previous slides I namely uh, managing these versions manually well the problem is that we are forced to manually uh, keep track of um, the essential differences between different versions of a file that is to say what is the essential and distinct content of each file for of each version um, compared to other versions of that file we also want to keep track of um, how different versions of a file are related for example through branching and merging because this will be relevant when it comes to um, to doing further merges for example if code if different versions have a, of, of, a, of, a, of a code base have, have the same common ancestor it is likely that um, they will interoperate ie they'll be compatible um, as opposed to uh, versions that do not share a common ancestor we also will need to keep track of how versions of uh, different files are related so these code dependencies that I just mentioned and um, for anything for any further work that we want to do we need to uh, have a system for deciding uh, which which version we should be basing further work on now unless we have photographic memory we're going to have to record this information s somehow to remind us in future of course the obvious way to do this is to simply choose file names that are descriptive um, and tell you uh, how f the, distinct, the distinct content of each file and also um, uh, by virtue of, of the um, commonalities and differences in the file names tell you how these files, how these different versions of files are related so one option is to record this information in file names and directory structure so and also uh, how, we, how we nest our, our files um, another option would be to record this information inside files themselves or to have a separate document somewhere uh, like a spreadsheet or whatever whatever it is th that records this information like to cross to cross reference and to keep track of, of what's what there are however some issues um, surrounding this for example if you okay so if you follow this link here you might end up with a with a situation that could be quite quite common could seem quite familiar the story told in file names so clearly this this person has chosen file names that are meant to be first of all um, indicative of chronology when this um, when these files were produced when these versions were produced then the file names start out as being quite dis reasonably descriptive and they relate um, s some information about the relations between these versions but then obviously it's something um, some frustration snuck in uh, which meant that if you look back at these files 
uh, in a week from now or a month from now, uh, you might not be able to tell um, which one to use and indeed <laughs> ultimately the solution seems to be to just start over. Uh, by the way, this I mean these these files here are um, are meant to be data, uh, whereas we've only talked about papers or uh, plain or text and uh, source code so far. But um, the idea is the same, namely that there are issues with uh, using file names. So to be a bit more specific, what are the problems with with um, uh, recording this this information? Well. It's not only so recording the information is, is one thing we need to do that manually we're also forced uh, when we are doing the combining of content from different versions to do so manually so for example we combine different versions or we merge versions in order to produce a version that meets specific requi specific requirements uh, or we want to merge versions because we've been editing them in different places we've been editing the same file both on a personal laptop and on a work desktop um, and we need to st stick with one file somehow we need to um, put these changes together into a single file we need to merge these changes or we m well would have to uh, combine changes made by different authors um, on different uh, machines um, who've each added some some content to their own copies of a file so we need to merge and we need to merge manually that is to say we need to um, combine the right things and once we've produced these merged uh, files, we need to keep track of those results. So whenever we branch, we want to reflect that branching somehow and record that. Whenever we merge, we'd also want to record that so that you um, keep a, a record of the provenance uh, of versions of files and how these are related. So the main issues with do-it-yourself version control are that it's quite time consuming you um, have to do all this manually that's simply time consuming it also requires extreme care and attention um, and discipline self-discipline uh, and if you're collaborating with others it requires um, discipline on the on the part of everybody everybody involved now no matter how much care and attention you pay to this because it, it is a lot of detailed work uh, a lot of repetition etc etc uh, on a daily basis pr potentially this is prone to human error and ultimately, when once you start to deal with many files and many versions, as is typically the case in um, in software development, uh, this becomes somewhat unmanageable. Another issue is that um, in do-it-yourself version control, you yourself have kind of maybe a in an ad hoc way chosen your own um, your own uh, system or your own approach for keeping track of versions. Your own, for example, file name. Uh, naming convention uh, but everybody has their own system every, everybody has their own preferences and but unless everybody sticks to the same system there's going to be difficulties with um, combining content uh, from different people and there's going to be difficulties collaborating trying to convince other people that your system is the right system or the better system etc etc so before I tell you what version control systems offer you in the way of a solution to these problems that I've identified uh, I first want to just make you aware of what we're talking about here um, in this presentation and, and in also part two um, in the second virtual tutorial on virtual control. What, what, what kind of virtual control systems we're actually talking about because there's a range of systems. Well, we're, we're going to focus on um, the sort of category of virtual control systems that were developed and optimized uh, for managing plain text files. So that can include simple text documents uh, but also includes any file that contains human readable markup, uh, in other words, source code. Um, if numerical data is formatted as, as plain text, for example, in comma separated value files, then this then um, that is also um, amenable to being managed by these version control systems. So the version control systems which I'm going to discuss are um, of the kind that are less useful for managing uh, non plain text data, i.e., binary data, which includes um, documents, for example, Microsoft uh, Office documents uh, that are encoded in a binary format, um, whether it's no, regardless of whether it's proprietary or open source, it's just the, the key thing that matters is whether it's uh, plain text or not. So, executables, application executables, um, images, and video. 
and also numerical data that is stored not as plain text but in a binary binary format for example uh, HDF5 or NetCDF so uh, for various reasons the virtual control systems which I'm going to discuss um, are less useful uh, for managing these files uh, essentially it's because um, they cannot um, identify as as clearly the the differences between versions and some of the automatic uh, tracking that happens is, is not as clear they're also less efficient at managing these these types of files because certain optimizations with regards to compression etc cannot be done so what are these version control systems that I'm talking about and what do they offer as a solution to the issues identified well um, version control systems are, are essentially just tools, they're, they're software tools that um, provide a framework to uh, automatically, or at least partly automatically, record meaningful information about versions of files and what's crucial is that they do it in a consistent and systematic way. So they have some schema of how to record this information and this has been implemented so that when you use the tool the information about versions is recorded in exactly a certain way. Now that gives you a lot of advantages that allows these these tools to um, help automate uh, the tracking of versions and to keep track also of the differences between different versions and they do this by um, recording um, when, whenever you choose to they record the state the current state of a set of files uh, as a snapshot and then provide easy access at any whenever you want providing easy access to these snapshots so what does that mean it means that uh, oh, this is several advantages I mean one of the things that that provide that that version control systems provide therefore is a kind of safety net so because you have uh, a, a, a timeline of snapshots of um, the state of your of, of, of whichever files you choose to include in a snapshot over time you can go back uh, at any stage and recover or revert to um, the state of those files at that earlier time so you can make changes quite freely without having to worry about uh, losing any functionality or losing anything now these snapshots the particular feature of the fact that, that you can take that you re can record a snapshot of a set of files and not just of one single file in isolation means that you can uh, capture essentially freeze in time you can capture a snapshot of the uh, dependencies between particular versions of, uh, of files for example with the source code that I mentioned um, if you take a snapshot of the code that works version you are essentially taking a snapshot of the uh, of the all the uh, files in the code base uh, that um, interoperate, that work together uh, at that point in time. Some of the other things that version control systems allow you to do is uh, they enable you to easily duplicate uh, and synchronize files in multiple locations. So they act kind of as, a, um, as an alternative to manually transferring files. Um, so that is, is therefore saves you time but it also avoids uh, potential errors that you that you might make for example if you are manually transferring files from a work machine to a, to a, to a personal machine um, or from different one work machine to another work machine uh, for example from Archer to your local machine or vice versa you need to remember um, which files are the right ones to transfer uh, which could just be a matter of checking your file names but then of course your file names need to have been correct and if you forgot to change that then um, you've got a problem so um, version control systems uh, essentially uh, because they have these snapshots they, they allow you they also act as a as a backup of your data um, now whether it's whether they actually act as a backup still depends on where the snapshots are stored obviously if you um, if, if you store if you sto store these snapshots at the same place where the files themselves are located uh, and your um, and that machine uh, is somehow damaged the hardware is somehow damaged then um, 
you still lose your data. So this easy synchronization means that you can easily work on different machines. And not only can you yourself easily work on different machines and easily, easily synchronize uh, files between different machines, it also, uh, virtual control systems also enable, uh, facilitate collaborative work on the same set of files uh, at, the same at the same time, because they allow um, collaborators of yours to synchronize changes uh, with you, essentially, and vice versa. And these virtual control systems also um, capture, uh, they automatically, one of the things they consistently and systematically capture is uh, the contributions made by different authors. So you can always say retrospectively, this particular version of a file was um, created or recorded by this particular person. So one of the things that this, this automatic or partly automated change tracking gives us is that it facilitates this process of branching, which I mentioned earlier. So just to be a bit more um, specific about what, what branching is, in other words, you, you, what it is is you modify one or more files uh, with a particular goal in mind. For example, when you're talking about software, the goal might be to introduce uh, a new feature, feature or to, um, to develop a, a fix to a bug. Um, and you do this by creating a new branch. A branch being essentially, uh, as we will see later, uh, a kind of copy um, of, uh, of a set of files or one or more files. So that to the advantages of branching is that um, you can um, modify, do, do, the, uh, do, what I, do what I just said, namely mod modify one or more files with a particular goal in mind, simultaneously and independently and in parallel, for example, by different authors, um, by creating multiple branches. So in the example earlier, Alice and Bob and yourself were all working on, on essentially um, uh, copies and of, of the same set of files uh, with a common ancestor and they were introducing um, different changes so you each they each had their own branch. Then at a later date, as previously described, you can combine these differently modified versions of the same files by merging them and the automatic change tracking makes both the branching and the merging a lot easier and a much much less error prone. What the, what the merging does is it allows us to pick and choose changes that are developed on these various branches and integrate them as you like. Furthermore, we can also use um, the consistent systematic versioning information provided by virtual control systems to facilitate um, reproducible computational research. In other, what, what I mean by that is that um, if you are running simulations and um, you publish the results, if, you, if your source code used for these simulations is under version control, i.e. is managed by, a, by using a version control system, then you could uh, explicitly in your publication mention the exact uh, version of the code which produced these results that you published. This means, therefore, that if the code is also made publicly available um, using the, um, the framework of this version control system, then anybody can uh, rep try to reproduce your research by taking exactly that same version of the code, compiling it, and running the same simulations again. Uh, it also facilitates uh, testing and development work for much the same reason. Um, again, you can, you can track exactly which version of code you're running, and therefore you can clearly identify uh, which version of a code works or doesn't work, uh, what the problems are, um, whether it runs faster or slower. So benchmarking, and development, these kinds of things are, are, are made easier by using version control. So getting a bit more practical and concrete, how do we actually use these version control tools? In Linux and OS X, um, some of the most common version control tools are actually pre-installed by default and are available from the command line in a shell session. Alternatively, you can download a standalone client application with a graphical user interface, um, of which there are many available. These are especially valuable in Windows, where uh, you would not have um, a readily available command line environment with pre-installed tools. 
but they're also can be very useful for um, in Linux or in OS X. Finally, for some version control systems, um, you can set up or use a uh, web-based interface directly in the browser. Let's now have a look at some of the most common version control systems. First of all, CVS is mature and established. Um, however, it's not as popular anymore. It's somewhat archaic in the way it deals with files and also um, in its interface and what it asks of its users. SVN, or Subversion, was the successor to CVS. Um, for a while it was very widespread and is still quite widespread. It's certainly more flexible and efficient than CVS, including at handling binary files. Git is uh, a lot newer. Um, it was developed by Linus Torvalds um, uh, of Linux fame. It's uh, certainly faster than a lot of other version control systems. It has some very powerful features, which we will discuss in the second virtual tutorial on version control. And it's very popular uh, for many software projects, um, including in, in Silicon Valley and uh, startups, um, uh, as well as in some, some uh, bigger uh, established um, software development based companies. Uh, part, of, part of the reason why it is popular is thanks to um, the website GitHub, which is, uh, as the name suggests, connected uh, somehow to Git in that um, it, uh, it exploits some of the features that Git gives you. But it gi basically the, it's a website that offers additional functionality uh, that integrates well with um, the way that people use uh, Git as a version control tool. Mercurial is somewhat similar to Git, uh, but in some ways simpler to use. So this is just, just a quick overview um, to refer back so that so these names actually mean something to you. In the second virtual tutorial, we'll discuss uh, um, the differences between some of these systems in more detail. Now, uh, this is a good point at which to discuss some core concepts and terminology. So the point of the, of the next part of the presentation is really to give you a foundation uh, uh, about that consisting of some of the most important concepts and ideas so that you can um, speak the lingo essentially uh, and you can pick up um, and start to use uh, hopefully arbitrary version control tools. So I've highlighted here just a list of some of the top uh, some of the um, concepts and terms that we'll be looking at defining. First of all, a repository. So a repository, as name suggests, is where things get stored. It's uh, the most important um, sort of object. It's a central object, a central uh, focus of, of version control systems. It's the archive, um, stored storage archive, of all the snapshots of versions of files that were recorded. So a repository captures uh, the changes between successive recorded versions of a file and it keeps track of uh, whether and how versions of files are related, for example through merging or branching. A repository uh, also includes a log. Now what's a log? A log is, as name suggests, some kind of record um, that is to say, it's it's a record of, of metadata, data describing um, when, uh, by who, and um, optionally why each snapshot of versions of files was recorded. So the idea is that the log gives you a, a, a meaningful overview of the history of all the snapshots that are stored in the repository. Another key concept uh, when it comes to version control systems is uh, that of the working copy. So the working copy is um, a local copy of the repository. It doesn't have to be a copy of the entire repository. It can just be a copy of um, a part of the repository, um, specifically of a copy of s uh, not all the files in the repository not, or not all the versions. The The details depend a bit on, on which version control system you're using, but, but we're talking here a bit more generally. So the um, the working copy, or your a particular working copy of yours, is located on the machine that you are currently using, regardless actually of where the repository itself is stored. So we've not said anything about where the repository lives, 
but um, the working copy um, is the thing that you actually deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So it shows your current local versions of files. These are the files that you are editing, that you are working on, uh, hence the term working copy. So your versions of files uh, may differ from the latest versions in the repository, either because you have made changes to these files or because the repository itself um, has changed uh, by uh, somebody um, uh, updating it with newer versions of the same files. So you could have take a, taken a copy of the repository and not done anything, but still the versions that are shown in your uh, local uh, copy are different from the ones that are currently in the repository, simply because the repository has changed. So the, the working copy may also contain files that are not yet recorded in the repository. So if you yourself have created files, these will not suddenly automatically appear in a repository. Um, in other words, uh, new unrecorded files, and uh, change as well as changes to existing files, are not automatically uh, propagated to the repository. They're not automatically recorded. Uh, this needs to be done explicitly. So in other words, going back to the idea of snapshots, I said that version control systems allow you to take snapshots of the current state of files and record these in the repository. But this is not done automatically. You have to choose to do it at particular points where this is meaningful and useful. Finally, um, you are not restricted in any way to having a single working copy. Uh, in principle, you could have however many working copies you like. That I mean, it might get confusing if you have too many, but a typical example, say, is where you're working on these files in different machines, and in, on each machine that you log into, you might have a working copy, and these might differ uh, slightly. Other concepts include that of checking out or cloning. So to check out is simply to obtain uh, a working copy. So essentially, this is the act of of duplicating uh, whatever part of a repository you choose locally on your machine. So it's the act of uh, obtaining this working copy. Merging, as we've already discussed to some extent, is, is literally the, the combining of two versions of a file or set of files into one. Um, now, merging can happen either uh, with versions of files that are locally in your working copy, or it can, can be done to versions of files in the repository itself. This depends, again, on, on the details of a particular version control system, whichever one you're using and what, what you choose to do. We're, we're speaking here a bit more generically. Now, as you can imagine, uh, combining two files can lead to conflicts. Now, what I mean by that is that when a merge happens, the version control system tries to combine the content of two separate files. Now, on a line-by-line -line basis, it will look at what the differences are. If the change, if the content um, of uh, the two files um, is different in non-overlapping sections of the file, that is to say in non-overlapping lines, not in the same lines in the file, then it will simply uh, uh, add, typically by default it will simply add the content of both files into a merged version. If however there are um, changes in uh, the same part or section of the file, then the conversion control system will point out uh, that there is a potential conflict. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't know what to do with these um, um, uh, overlapping um, uh, contents. So you need to actually uh, decide uh, how to resolve these conflicts by making a decision about how to uh, combine the content. So the point here is that a version control system um, when you merge files, it tells you what the conflicts are, but it doesn't telepathically sort of know what you want to do. Um, it simply facilitates the um, the uh, process of merging, and Im it also, uh, in a very reliable way, points out these conflicts. It doesn't have to. It doesn't rely on you um, manually finding these conflicts. To update means to essentially take the latest um, state of the repository and update your working copy. So uh, you may have uh, checked out a repository locally, 
so you have a working copy. You may not have made any changes to any of the files, but a week a week goes by, you don't do anything. You don't make any changes. Now, the repository might have changed because somebody might have changed some of the files. You want to find out what the latest version is, so you do an update. So you, you are essentially synchronizing your local copy by asking the repository what the current state is. And um, what actually happens, typically, generically, is that the version control system then attempts to merge the latest versions of files in the repository into the corresponding versions of those same files in your working copy. And as for um, as described earlier, I mean, because this is a merge, it can lead to, to conflicts which need to be um, potentially need to be resolved. Another key uh, concept is that of uh, committing or checking in. Um, as the name suggests, what you're doing here, this is this is the actual uh, recording of a snapshot of the current state of one or more files in your working copy as a snapshot in the repository. So you are um, deciding, when you, when you make a commit, when you commit your local uh, versions of files, you are saying uh, these particular versions of files as they are right now, I'm going to record in the repository as a, as a snapshot. What actually happens then is that um, data is actually transmitted from your working copy to the repository, wherever that repository is located. So this is the reverse kind of synchronization as an update. Um, now commits, uh, so the taking of these snapshots, are typically accompanied or required to be accompanied by a message, a comment, provided by yourself. Um, we'll talk about a bit about that uh, later, about the content of these so-called commit messages. Finally, um, to branch means to create uh, copies, not necessarily uh, physical copies, but logical copies anyway in the in the version control system of one or more files in the repository. Now, as I described earlier, this is typically done because you want to pursue a particular um, type of work. Uh, for example, in software, you might have might be trying to implement a new feature or new functionality, and you want to do this um, independently of the original original parent uh, files say because you don't because you don't want to um, break anything when it comes for example to software you don't want to break anything in the in the current version that works you simply want to take a copy and develop whatever you're developing separately and once it works then you can um, decide what to do so these newly spawned um, copy versions of files are tracked by a version control system as a distinct from the parent files and um, they are synchronized so you so you will have uh, when, when you when you branch ie when you create branches you will you can do this either in your rep repository or in your local copy depending on a version control system and your local copies of these uh, branched files are synchronized via commits and updates independently of co uh, commits and updates to the original parent files. So this is how um, the changes to these branches are kept separate and distinct. Now later on, when you are happy that the developments on one particular branch uh, are, uh, are working or are and, and are, are needed to be included in some final, uh, in some, in some final version of, of uh, your files, then you can integrate the content of the files on one branch with that on another branch by merging. So as, th as I said earlier, um, just a note about commit messages. So commit messages are, um, they're optional, but they're, they're, um, you're prompted to provide them whenever you commit uh, files to the repository. Whatever you enter is shown um, when you look at uh, the log of the repository. So when you, as as we'll see in the demonstration, when you look at the log in the repository, you will see a history, essentially just a, a chronological timeline of uh, the commits that were made to the repository. You'll, in other words, you'll see a timeline of the snapshots that were recorded and by, by who they were recorded and what the comments were that were provided by that person.
So these comments are meant to inform uh, you how to use the repository and how to use the versions contained therein, not only by yourself, uh, but also by current and future collaborators. So um, the idea there is that by providing meaningful commit messages, uh, you are avoiding the situation where, you, where uh, hours, days, weeks, months, years from now, you yourself look back at the work that you did and go, well, actually, what, what are these different versions? What is, what is the meaning of this? Why did I make these changes? Um, so it's a, it's a summary. It should be a summary, meaningful summary. There are other software tools like uh, that are also part of version control systems like diff, which tell you literally what the actual differences are between files. But that will spit out potentially a whole lot of lines of, of code um, or text. The commit messages, on the other hand, are meant to give you a very human readable, uh, co contextually relevant and meaningful summary. So they should explain the reasons for the commits. They should explain why you are committing what you are committing and you're giving whatever detail level of context and detail is appropriate, which depends not only on you, but also on the project, on your collaborators, etc. The typical format of these commit messages is a one line summary, followed by uh, a paragraph or, um, or more of, of more details. So the kind of thing to avoid doing uh, when creating commit messages is um, displayed nicely in this um, XKCD comic, which I will just call up. So you might start out uh, a project providing some very meaningful commit messages. Created main loop, time and control, enabled config file parsing, miscellaneous bug fixes. The miscellaneous bug fixes is already, is already sounding a bit vague. So um, the, the, the what happens often is that as you make commits um, frequently, uh, you may get uh, frustrated and start to just provide less and less meaningful commit messages. So it would be good to try and uh, avoid this. As a short aside, um, it's worth mentioning that um, so far we've not actually said anything about where repositories uh, live. Um, we've said we've talked about our local working copy of the repository, but we've not said where the repository is actually stored, where where it's um, which actually lives. So this there are several options. Um, it could be uh, located uh, on your own machine. It can be located at a different machine, for example, a server at your uh, institution. It can also be hosted on a public website, uh, such as, for example, GitHub, um, and another one is Bitbucket. So we will discuss more about this in part two. So, taking a taking a step back from what we just looked at, um, looking at actually starting to use virtual control systems and, and and thinking about how you might use it in your work. Um, some word, words of warning. So version control systems, as we've seen, give you a lot of, of powerful um, options for managing versions of files and for collaborating. Um, so they're a powerful tool. tool. However, they're not a magic bullet. Um, so they won't uh, magically solve um, uh, uh, the management of your files. You need to uh, know what you're doing, kind of, and you need to know how to figure out what, what it is you want to do uh, both when you're working by yourself and when you're working with others. So um, you, you need to think um, and decide how to manage your work. Uh, finally, also when working collaboratively, it's not, um, so <laughs> version control systems are not uh, a replacement for communicating. They're not um, uh, a, a golden solution for uh, deciding what uh, versions are are kept and maintained. Uh, they're just they're just a tool. So when you're working with other people on the same set of files, be that um, a report or a, or a software a source code, uh, you will always need to uh, communicate um, and plan ahead what you're going to do. So that's the end of this presentation. Uh, so the, this is the end of part one. In other words, uh, the first virtual tutorial on version control. Between now and second virtual tutorial, um, a scripted practical will appear on the Archer website, and you're recommended to have a look at this. Um, 
and work through it so that you get uh, some more experience, um, that you get some experience anyway using um, SVN yourself. And it will help you put into practice the concepts from this presentation and solidify that foundation. Then in part two, uh, we'll look at various things, including the differences between uh, uh, different categories of version control systems, uh, give you a bit more of an idea of about what's going on, on uh, in the background uh, so that you know uh, when, when something goes wrong, what, why it might be going wrong, and so that also you can make uh, well-informed decisions about what version control system to use and how to um, how and where uh, to store your repositories. I will also look at uh, Git, the one of the other version control systems, and how that compares to, um, to for example, to, to what we've seen so far from SVN. Um, and I'll discuss a bit about which version control system you might like to use and what some of the considerations are um, in this regards. So thank you for attending this virtual tutorial. If you have any questions, please feel free to email the um, Archer Help Desk.